Wednesday, June 3. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Carol Francis. In an update on the COVID-19 pandemic, Jamaica now has a recovery rate of 60%. The total number of recoveries stands at 356 after 34 more people were released from care. As of Wednesday morning, Jamaica had recorded two more cases of the virus, bringing the number of active cases to 225. One is a male aged 69 from St. Catherine. The other is a 23-year-old female also from St. Catherine. Both cases are related to the workplace cluster in St. Catherine. The number of confirmed cases in the island since the start of the pandemic is 590. 356 people have recovered. Nine persons have died. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says the island will be using a travel bubble system as a guide for people entering the country. Speaking in the House of Representatives on Tuesday, Mr. Holness described the travel bubble as countries which pose the lowest risk of spreading the coronavirus. Based on a risk assessment of the countries from which persons are seeking to enter Jamaica and the travel routes which they will take, we have evaluated specific criteria which includes similar management and profile results for the epidemic regarding spread, death rate, infection prevention and control measures, contact tracing protocols and other criteria. Such countries would constitute a travel bubble that would be governed by modified protocols that would speed up the re-entry process. The countries include Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, the Cayman Islands, Montserrat, Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos, St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Prime Minister underscored the point that everyone entering the island will be screened. During the period June 1 to 14, everyone arriving in Jamaica will go through a screening process that has two elements to it. The first being the temperature check and observation of symptoms at the airport. At the airport. So I don't want to, to, to give the specific steps because depending on circumstances, they may change. But, so I'm not going to give them in order. But the, the screening is across, screening is from now to the 30th. Everybody coming in must be screened. It is, screening is not optional. Screening has two elements to it. The first element is the temperature check and the observation for symptoms. Now that is supposed to be done on the aircraft by some of the airlines coming in. That's part of their protocol. Some of them walk down the aisle and take your temperature. They will observe and make a little note and then they pass that on so we, we know. All right? They are supposed to do that before you go on the plane as well. All right? We will do that screening. There is another element of the screening which is the risk-based assessment. Where are you coming from? What's your country of origin? Very important. The government is considering a return to the shift system in some schools when the new academic year begins in September. Minister with Responsibility for Education, Carl Samuda, says the issue of spacing of students when complying with physical distancing measures is a challenge the ministry is now grappling with. We get more in this report. The education minister says several options are being explored to ensure that COVID-19 protocols are observed in schools when the new school year begins. Our schools are now being cleaned and sanitized to facilitate the return of students to the physical classroom setting. Furniture is also being rearranged to ensure that the necessary physical distances, distancing is maintained. Seating is being arranged six feet apart for the average classroom of 24 by 24. This means there will be only 10 students and a teacher that can be accommodated in the existing facilities. Mr. Speaker, we have the option of purchasing space 
from private high schools where necessary. And representation has been made by the private high schools for assistance. And it has been received warmly because we understand the predicament of the private high schools. Private schools, period. We can also step up our usage of technology such as flipped classrooms and remote learning or staggered the days and times that students go to school. Mr. Samuda also noted that most schools at the primary level are underpopulated. However, opposition spokesman on education Peter Bunting said placing students in some of these schools would be difficult as many are in remote areas. He also expressed concern about the possibility of a return to the shift system. We've been moving away from the shift system. You're now talking and putting everybody back on the shift system. I don't think that is, is desirable. Let us use up the private institutions we have. Let us build out a proper technology infrastructure to support not just remote learning, if we have to fall back on that or use some combination of that, but also to support remote working. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Jamaica's airports now boast modern air traffic control technologies. The procurement has improved equipment performance and achieves 99.9% .9 aeronautical systems availability. The new technology was implemented by Aeronautical Telecommunications Limited, Aerotel. This was disclosed by Minister of Transport and Mining, Robert Montague, while opening the 2020-2021 sectoral debate in the House of Representatives. Additionally, the implementation of the Network Operations Control Center was completed, and this enabled complete remote visibility of the aeronautical network infrastructure island-wide with the ability to diagnose and respond to faults, and sometimes even as they are developing and before they become service affected. A new computerized fault management system has also been implemented to improve efficiency, quality, and analysis of response and reporting in respect of aeronautical system faults. Mr. Montague said these were undertaken despite the challenges faced by the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. Project manager at the Caribbean Maritime University, CMU, Elaine Hayden, says she saw no evidence of a contract between the institution and business supply source BSS or logistics company One. That's her statement at the Public Accounts Committee, the PAC, on Tuesday. There, there is no contract that I am aware of. When I requested the contract, it wasn't. The matter was passed. The, once it went to the procurement committee, the norm is that it goes to the office of the president for sign off, and then the contract arrangements are handled there. I have not seen the contract. I do not know if one exists. When I requested it, there was none. The project manager was responding to queries from committee member Lisa Hanna, who raised questions about her involvement as a project manager in the nearly one million US dollar arrangement to procure material for a 701 million dollar three-story student block at the CMU's main campus in East Kingston. Meanwhile, officers of the institution told PAC that they were following direct instructions from the former president, Professor Fritz Pinnock's office for the payout of contracted services. So I report directly to the president of the university and my instructions come from the president of the university. So I can't of my own get up and say I'm going to change and put up a structure X or Y. It has to go through a process. The committee was continuing its examination of findings of the December 2019 Auditor General Special Audit Report on Governance, Procurement and Contracts Management at the CMU and the Minister of Education, Youth and Information. The COVID-19 pandemic has unearthed the issue of food security and laid it squarely on the table. With economies globally hemorrhaging due to the virus, nations have to grapple with feeding themselves. Locally, what is to be our response? One obvious answer is 
Why not start your own backyard garden? Marlon Samuels reports. Yeah, man, welcome. Yeah, yeah, man. So welcome to the operation. As the COVID-19 pandemic threatens the globe and the looming threat of food scarcity hangs like the sword of Damocles, more people are turning to backyard farming. Cultural and Rastafarian studies lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Dr. Ajamu Nangwaya, is among this growing population of backyard farmers. COVID-19 is my ally that is helping people to see the wisdom of what I've been talking about, that let's grow, let's eat what we grow, and grow what we eat, you know? And it's a, it's a base, it's a message of survival. That is what's motivated me. We not being dependent on overseas relatives sending money to feed us, when we in our country can feed ourselves. And we also not going around and begging charity from people so they can take liberty with us. Because as I said, liberty comes through carelessness. So if we can't feed ourselves, we can't have big talk. We don't have to bow and scrape and bow big man and boss and go to MPs and say, boy, you can't give me 5,000 dollars because I'm fitting it hungry. No, you grow food in your yard and your neighbor exchange and you can have an adequate diet. It's about survival and independence and as African people, that is important to us because people always take liberty with us, even our own. They become petty bourgeois and middle class and they start to look down on us. But when you can't feed yourself and take care of yourself, you don't have to go out to nobody and beg them. A resident of Gordon Town, St. Andrew, Dr. Nanguaya says his passion for backyard farming is deeply rooted in how imperialists treated Jamaica in the 1970s. Rastas introduced me to farming as a young boy in Spanish Town. And I've just maintained that um, relationship with the earth. One of, one of the probably most compelling reasons why I plant is my experience in 1970s Jamaica. When the Michael Mandel administration was trying to assert Jamaica's independence and the international scene and taking position that American imperialism didn't like, for example, supporting Cuban troops in Angola against racist South Africa, the, the United States put such pressure on us that we thought we were going to starve in Jamaica. For one, people start to marry fast-moving goods with slow-moving goods. If you want a pound of flour, you have to buy some toilet paper. I have to buy something. So it taught me that for us to have independence in the Caribbean, it is important for us to feed ourselves so we're able to resist imperialism when it comes against us. Dead leaves are a natural occurring organic material and is key ingredient in some of the best compost that can be made. The lecturer explained how to make organic fertilizer from dead leaves. Yeah, this era is my compost production era. As you see, we have a number of piles going on. This is the current one that I'm trying to make. So what I do is the smaller the pieces of organic material, organic waste, the easier it is for the composting or the breakdown process to take place. So I aid it by chopping up like leaves from the cane, the leaf from the trumpet tree in order to put them in smaller pieces. So just go around chopping them up. Dr. Nanguaya grows a variety of cash crops such as bananas, peppers, mangoes, lime, pineapples, callaloo, and pumpkin. Everything on the farm is grown organically. He also grows herbs and spices. I try to grow a wide range of things. You see there are a lot of bananas in, in, in this farm operation. But when you look between the banana stands or the clusters, you will see different things. Over there, you will see a tangerine tree coming up. You will see pine growing. I grow also cane. Um, I grow you know, things by spices. You see a rosemary plant right there. It, it, I grew as you know, wide range of things um, as possible. You'll go around and you'll say um, cho-cho. Dr. Nanguaya believes Jamaica should be geared towards a gift economy. A person who is disabled and can't farm, they wouldn't have anything to eat, but the gift economy means that you have a need, you can't meet that need, but you're a member of the community, so we produce and we give you your share from our backyard. 
So we're looking at a different um, principle of how we move forward. One of the things that even Rastafari thought around idle liberty is that we don't sell food, we don't buy and sell food. But as an ideal, in reality, Rastas will buy food. Our thing is to produce food and we share food. He is also advocating for greater people-to-people -people relationship in the Caribbean. If we start up buildings between each other, people-to-people -people links, these prejudices that we may have and fear and stereotypes we have of each other will reduce. So as a region, if we start to become self-sufficient, it it's going to increase ties between us. And we can also force governments to create the infrastructure so that you have greater people-to-people -people connection in the Caribbean, where they're making it easy and cheaper for us to go between territories. He is also calling for stronger laws to tackle Prader Larceny. That's a challenge in Jamaica, and Prader Larceny is something that really frightens many. But if I catch a guy inside here, I, I will see that as an act of unwarranted aggression, and I'm going to defend myself. But if a guy is sneaking and come and do them things, then there's nothing I can do. But if a person is stealing from you, it's an attack on you, I have to defend it. But um, fortunately, it hasn't happened yet. Although, no, I lost a banana, a bunch of banana down on the river, but I said, throw down on the riverside, but not inside the yard. But no, man, if I catch a guy inside us, so I have to defend it. And I saw Jamaicans after, like farmers, we need to set up self-defense network, so we're patrolling our place. So if a guy tries something, we're armed and ready to defend it. Now man, we have to take it to the criminals, them, and like, we, we act like we're afraid of them. We can't acquire a gun to legally, and we can't defend it. Marlon Samuels for PBCJ News. Earl Jarrett has been elected chairman of the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, ECJ, effective March 1, 2020. Mr. Jarrett was elected from among the four selected commissioners of the ECJ in keeping with the Electoral Commission Interim Act 2006, which states that the selected commissioners shall elect one of their number to be chairman of the commission and so inform the Governor General. Mr. Jarrett was appointed to the ECJ in 2013 under the chairmanship of Dorothy Pine McClarty, who retired on December 31, 2019. She was replaced by retired Chief Justice Zalia McCalla on January 1, 2020. Gabriel Thompson will now take us through today's business report. In Tuesday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index declined by 917 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 83 stocks, of which 37 advanced, 37 declined, and 9 traded firm. The junior market index declined by 20 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica, 138 Student Living Variable Preference, and Berger Paints Jamaica. Stocks declined for AMG Packaging and Paper Company, Burita Investments Limited, and Caribbean Cream. Trading firm were 1834 Investments, Cargo Handlers Limited, and Consolidated Bakeries Jamaica. Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with over 12 million units, followed by JMMB Group Limited with 7.7 7 million units and Carreras Limited with 3.5 million units. Now for the foreign exchange, the U.S. dollar on Tuesday, June 2, ended trading at $142.97. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $106.44. The pound sterling traded for $177.45. And the euro ended trading at $162.05. Oil climbed above $40 a barrel for the first time since March on Wednesday, supported by signs of recovery in coronavirus hit demand lower U.S. inventories and expectations that OPEC will keep oil output cuts in place. Brent crude gained 41 cents to settle at $39.98 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate crude rose 56 cents to $37.37 a barrel. That's it for the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Prevention and treatment services for non-communicable diseases, NCDs, have been severely disrupted since the COVID-19 pandemic began. This situation is of significant concern because people living with NCDs are at a higher risk 
of severe COVID-19 related illnesses and death. As the country slowly reopens, people living with NCDs are being cautioned to avoid going out in public. Instead, they can access online medical services, including delivery of their prescriptions. Simone Absalom tells us more about the situation in this week's Living Healthy Report. According to a recent WHO survey, the impact on medical services for people living with NCDs is global and low-income countries are most affected. The results released today show that more than half of the countries surveyed have partially or completely disrupted services for treatment of hypertension, half for treatment of diabetes and related complications, and 42% for cancer treatment, and 31% for cardiovascular emergencies. Rehabilitation services have been disrupted in almost two-thirds of countries. The survey, which was completed by 155 countries during a three-week period in May, confirmed that in a majority of countries responding, Ministry of Health staff working in the area of NCDs were partially or fully reassigned to support the country's COVID-19 response. One in five countries are reporting that the reason for discontinuing services was a shortage of medicines, diagnostics and other technologies. The postponement of public screening programs, for example, for breast and cervical cancer was also widespread, reported by more than 50% of countries. With those numbers in mind, the WHO has provided some guidance. Building on previous guidance on maintaining essential services through the COVID-19 pandemic, today we're providing operational guidance on how best to put that into practice. Ensuring coordination and development of new ways to deliver care while limiting visits to health facilities is key to keeping people safe and ensuring health systems are not overburdened. This means using digital technologies to deliver some routine services remotely and expanding the amount of medications delivered to the home. In Jamaica, our health ministry has commenced home delivery of medication to drug serve patients 65 years and older. Patients in St. Thomas, Kingston and St. Andrew St. Catherine and Manchester were among the first to get their medication delivered at home. We have the Prescript mobile app. We have a, we have a drop off and pick up service. We have scheduled refill for persons who come to the pharmacy frequently with the same medication. And we have a number of other initiatives in which we contact clients to work out easy ways for them to receive their medication. Most people know the NHF is a customer-centric organization and with COVID-19 we actually looked at different ways of better serving our customers. Medication delivery is an idea that we have had under active discussion for a number of years and we found that this was an opportune time to implement this service. There are plans to expand to 30,000 other patients in the age group as the program rolls out. Remember, stay home as much as possible and stay safe. Here are a few tips from GRU and the Minions, courtesy of the WHO, the United Nations Foundation and Illumination. Hello everybody, it's me, GRU, but you already knew that. And I've got some tips to help you get through this challenging time. First, practice physical distancing. I'm sorry, I did not see you there. I've been doing it my whole life. Or there. Plus, there are lots of things you can do at home, like stay active with some sick dance moves, be daring, and rip up a new dish. I love the combination of gummy bears with meat. You can do video calls for all of your important meetings. What? <laughs> Sorry! Or just have some fun! Okay, not that much fun. Now, this does not come naturally to me, but try to be kind to each other. This is a tough time for everyone. So, that's it. Stay home, stay healthy, and remember, we're all in this together. What? 
but totally separate. You know what I mean. Yay! In regional news, the negotiations between St. Lucian government and the public sector unions are at a stalemate. Speaking ahead of Tuesday's sitting of Parliament, the Prime Minister of St. Lucia says he awaits a counter-proposal from the public sector unions. Stanley Lothian of HDS News Force reports. Prime Minister Alan Chastney says the next move in the ongoing negotiations with the public sector unions is up to the unions. Prime Minister Chastney says his government has placed its cards on the table and is open to any credible counter-offer. If in fact um, the uh, unions don't believe that three months and 50% um, is the right way, then fine, offer something else. We've indicated the amount that we're trying to save is $50 million. Um, we think that we've been fair. We've not cut anybody's salaries. What we were asked for was for a deferment um, so that government will still honor its responsibility to the workers, but through a process of a bond. Um, but I'm hoping that the unions will recognize and come to the table in good faith um, and offer us an alternative. So if there's something else on the table that can solve the problem, government is amenable to that. The Prime Minister and Minister for Finance says the government is facing a massive shortfall in revenue collection from a monthly high of about $110 million about one year ago to averaging about $55 million in the COVID-19 period. Something, he says, has to give. It's a difficult time and so my government is absolutely cognizant of that. We want to make sure that we've always put the safety of St. Lucians first. And we have to also now look at the economy. In the absence of tourism being able to open, have to find alternative things. And that's where the capital projects play such a critical role moving forward. Prime Minister Chastney continues to tout what he says is the reasonableness of his proposal to the public servants. The public sector unions disagree, arguing the Prime Minister's offer would be very disruptive to their members. The Prime Minister says, though not his preferred choice, his legal options are a constant consideration. Well, my government is constantly looking at all of its legal options, um, but I want to say that we've attempted at all times to um, interact with the, the workers um, and the unions in particular to find an amicable solution. Um, as I've indicated repeatedly, is it a situation where people... Um, don't believe that the numbers, the revenue numbers have dropped? Is it a situation where persons don't believe that there is $700 million in bonds that are being turned over? Is it a point where people don't believe that not everybody is turning over their bonds? Um, I think that uh, while we have put the evidence out with regards to capital projects, capital projects that we're doing are not being funded from the recurrent revenue. These um, were funds that came from the airport tax and also from the gas tax. And these are separate loans that are being funded by those revenue streams. So the argument that um, by uh, not doing some of these projects is somehow going to create cash for us to pay salaries is, 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 is not true. The two parties, the government on one hand and the public sector unions on the other, are as far apart as they have been from the start of the negotiations. But the clock is ticking. The two sides will have to face off at the negotiating table and be willing to compromise if an industrial relations crisis in the public sector is to be averted. Stanley Lucien for the HGS News Force. As the national recount of the general and regional elections in Guyana continues, the Citizenship Initiative, one of 11 parties which contested the March 2 elections, has debunked claims that 8,000 votes belonging to the disciplined services were rejected due to the lack of the GCOM six-digit stamp. Bibi Katoon reports from Newsroom, Guyana. Presidential candidate for the Citizenship Initiative, Rhonda Lamb, in an interview with the Newsroom on Sunday, said a check of the boxes where the disciplined services votes were intermixed shows that less than a dozen were rejected for lack of stamps. I took regions 1, up to 10, 
minus four because we're still counting and it's a lot still to go through. And I started looking at the SORs for those stations where we had discipline service ballots intermixed. And I can pretty much tell you ac across those stations for, for the nine regions so far that have been, um, the boxes that have been counted, if I found 10 for a lack of stamping, I found a lot. The APNU-AFC coalition is pushing the narrative that the votes of 8,000 discipline services ranks were not counted for lack of the GCOM six-digit stamp. A total of 8,369 ranks of the Guyana Police Force, the Guyana Prison Service and the Guyana Defence Force voted on February 21st. If the claims were true, it means only 369 of the votes from D-Day were counted. The TCI presidential candidate said such a suggestion is alarming. But I'm not sure where that figure came from. But to suggest that an entire group of Guyanese were disenfranchised, you know, almost all of them, that was alarming to me. And so I'm there tallying. At some point, we will release all of that data, you know, ballot box by ballot box, as it's tallied and counted, and we will place that in the public domain. Leaders of the People's Progressive Party and a new and united Ghana also debunked the APNU-AFC claims at the weekend as blatant lies aimed at riling up the voters. The ballots from the officers were stamped and intermixed at selected polling stations in each region. Recently, GCOM's public relations officer Yolanda Ward pointed out that there is no way to identify electors by way of ballots cast. So far, GCOM has completed the recount of regions 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. Bibi Katun reporting for the newsroom. In sports, we are on the track with athletics as St. Jago High School sprinter Kayla Bonick is elated after receiving a full scholarship to pursue a degree in biology at the University of Virginia. The 18-year-old is vice captain for the girls' track and field team. Earlier this year, Bonick finished third in the Class 1 200 meters at Central Champs. Last year, she competed in the Grace Kennedy sponsored Inter-Secondary School Sports Association Boys and Girls Athletics Championships, where she won bronze in the Class 1 100 meters. Four Jamaican student athletes are now triple All-American honorees for the 2020 National Collegiate Athletics Association NCAA Division II indoor track and field season. The athletes are from Lincoln University in Missouri. The news was announced last Tuesday by the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association. 16 Jamaicans were recognized, 12 females and 4 males, 9 in total from Lincoln, coached by Jamaican Victor Poppy Thomas. They were among the 716 athletes from 117 institutions who made the list. And that's our package. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same place, for more news and sports right here on PBCJ, the People's Station. Thank you.